Thanks, Laura. And Jeff will introduce himself in a few minutes. Um, Elena Canfer, nice to see you all. Uh, I'm going to give a very high-level overview, and I'm hoping that um, I can just sort of set the context for what Jeff's going to share about what technologies we can offer you. And CSA resources for startups. Um, I'm not the technology person. Um, but I love what technology can do for society. So what do you think of NCSA? When I say NCSA, do you know what that stands for? Can you raise your hand if you know what NCSA is? OK. National Center for Supercomputing Applications. Throw out a word. What do you think we do? Supercomputing. Great guess. Anything else? Why did this un 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 It's okay, I can talk. So I can at least follow. And I can talk because. All right. All right, here we go. Okay. Thank you. There's one more word in there that I want you to pay attention to. National Center, that's not that big a deal to be a center for national. Supercomputing, what's the other word? Applications. That's something we want to bring out in our conversation today because I think a lot of you have a wide range of ap potential applications for supercomputing, but also for cutting edge computational environments and that would be a more accurate way to describe NCSA. Um, as Laura mentioned, you might think of us as the National Petascale Computing Facility just down the road. Has anybody here had a tour of the NCPF? A couple people. Um, they're open for tours. We are open for tours. We encourage you to come by. A um, few things about it. It was designed to be a DOE, Department of Energy Level of Security. 88,000 square feet, LEED certified for environmental purposes, um, 400 gigabit per second bandwidth, they're pretty good. Uh, it's designed to have great cooling, um, and we have a great help desk, and it's nearby to the research park in UIUC. Okay, but as Laura said, this was built to house the Blue Water Supercomputer Center, which in 2008, granted by the NSF, $200 million um, proposal, we were asked to build the what was supposed to be the cutting edge supercomputer at the time. That was Blue Water. So you might have remembered when that was released. You might have heard history about it. Here's a little bit of details about Blue Waters. It was very exciting at the time. We had a lot of great users, and we'll tell you a little bit about that um, coming up. But when you're at the cutting edge, things are always changing. So Blue Waters was supposed to be decommissioned 10 years after it was installed in 2018. There were so many users using it, we were able to keep going for another two years. Um, but the nice thing is the NSF, the National Science Foundation, DOE keeps funding cutting edge supercomputing around the, the country at NCSA and elsewhere. So this is the level of technology I'm going to get to. We have CPUs, we have GPUs, we have SSUs, we have wafer scale chips. Jeff will talk to you about all that. We're always building um, new environments, and I'll show you what drives us in a minute. If all we had was the supercomputing, we, we put our link up here for you to apply for an allocation and leave. But that is just the beginning of what we have to offer you. What else is going on at NCSA? Has anybody visited this building up on North Campus? Okay. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about why we have such a big building. We started out a long time ago, distributed around campus. We do have the computers, the, high, the um, supercomputers sitting over at the National Center for Petascale. NCPF, near you. NPCF. NPCF, yeah, thanks. 
and we'll probably have to change that name soon. Um, anyways, what else is going on? A little bit about our background just to give you the context. We sit beneath the Vice Chancellor for Research at the University of Illinois. We have about 200 or plus faculty or staff working at NCSA, plus faculty affiliates, plus students, plus industry and small business users and partners. NCSA got started in 1985 when the National Science Foundation funded five supercomputer centers around the country. Why did they even do that? There, there was not a lot of supercomputing available. The idea was that their science at the time, this is back in 1985, a lot of cutting edge scientists had tons of data that they needed to be able to analyze. But there was no computer system to, to allow them to be able to analyze the data. So we had, we started out, Larry Smar, our original director, together with other scientists, made the proposal to the National Science Foundation to build these five supercomputer centers. One here in Illinois, one in Cornell, one in Pittsburgh, one in San Diego. We'll think of it. It got closed down early on, and I can't yeah, remember yeah. Where, where it was at. Pittsburgh, Cornell, San Diego, us, and there was one other. Anyways, old, old history. The scientists at the time, there was like a, a cabal of computational scientists, really smart, cutting edge scientists in computational astrophysics, environmental hydrology, computational chemistry, numerical relativity, bioinformatics and computational biology. This is before the human genome was even sequenced, right? And social sciences tried to get in there too, which is my background. And Larry Smar would meet with these computational scientists and say, what kind of computers do you need? And then he'd work with people like my colleague Jeff Tierstrup, who ran a lot of the technology systems, to build the computational systems to help the scientists solve the grand challenge scientific problems. Um, we still have a, a lot of subject matter expertise, legacy from 1980s, Earth, Earth data, space data, digital lab. I want to mention here we also have tremendous research in genomics. And as Laura said, I came from the Institute for Genomic Biology. Our director there, Gene Robinson, used to say, Astro astronomy data is nothing compared to genomic data. So we do actually have an in-house genomics expert team to help analyze um, data for us. What's the benefit about having so many different scientists working and driving the technology? If you're sitting in your field of, um, Steve Bopart was working on this project here. He's, many of you probably know him as a startup professor and so on. He had an a, a image that was taken that's a biological image and he was trying to differentiate types of tissue and tumors in the body and couldn't find any technology to do that. So our visualization team looked around with their colleagues who might have similar problems and found that a team in environmental, in um, atmospheric sciences had a similar problem in trying to differentiate in aerial images snow from clouds. Very similar problem. So NCSA having a history of interdisciplinary science and technology development developed a program with them called Picture to help solve both problems. So in addition to being driven by scientific grand challenges, back in the 1980s, our predecessor, John Stevenson, said, wait a minute, scientists don't just live in universities, they also are employed in industry. And the cutting edge industrial um, companies in our, in our country also have scientific problems. Why don't we engage with the industrial sector and have industry partners. And then was born our first, um, the first industry program at a supercomputer center. We're the, we're the first, we're the longest standing, we're the biggest. Um, we started with Eastman Kodak, and um, we had Eli Lilly, Caterpillar, Boeing, uh, Motorola I mentioned, and others um, across different industries. The model then was we would only have one industrial partner per industry. So they knew they were getting a competitive edge working with NCSA supercomputers. And 
we were able to still learn across different disciplines. Here's a selected list of our industry and legacy partners, current and legacy partners. Lots of them you can see all across different industries. We do work with many different in an industry. Now you'll see Symbiosis, a graduate of Enterprise Works here, and um, Jeff let me know too. We also have been working with EarthSense, Charmworks, and others at Research Park. And that's why we're here to tell you what we can offer. So that's all the computational side. Quickly, if we have industrial and scientific grand challenge users, and we have cutting edge high performance computing, there's something missing from that. You take all those people, so when we're talking about the technology, look at that picture, that's full of people. You get all these scientists, they're not experts in high performance computing, they're experts in their scientific problem, whether they're in industry or the university. So the first thing they'll say is, well, how the heck do I get you my data? That is not, a, well you know this, a trivial question. Um, so we also have to become experts in data engineering and management. Some of them have very high security um, data and environments that they are requiring. So we have to become experts in cybersecurity. Sometimes our users, our industrial or scientific users, have data problems. They have traditional analytics, but their data sets are so large, but they happen to be sparse. We have experts at NCSA who have experience with analyzing different data structures at a large scale. Modeling and simulations, we have to develop expertise in AI and machine learning more recently. Visualization, custom software development. We also, of course, have to have a really robust group that's involved with training and user support. With these words in front of you, throw out to me which appeals to you, which, even if you don't need help right now, which of these types of applications is your company or your interest in? Let me hear some words. AI. AI. Everybody's nodding. AI, yep. That's what we're seeing with our industrial partners too. Um, and on top of that, with AI and the very big data sets, we're also seeing a need for visualization and visual analytics because you can't always make sense of a bunch of numbers. So the nice thing is we also, because we're in this uh, position, we have a lot of futurists working among us and trend monitoring, like quantum computing and things. So we, we like to be at least looking five years down the road. So we have this mission statement that encompasses not just the computational environment, but the data analytics too. NCSA leads and supports digitally enabled scholarship, whether it's in big businesses, universities, or startups to solve the most challenging problems. Okay, Jeff, how do we do that? Can you give them a little bit about your background and explain how we do it? Uh, thank you, Elena. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about, uh, well, my background quickly is that I started at NCSA near its inception in 87, I believe, and uh, uh, became associate director and left in about 2000 and came over here and actually room 126 there was my original office and we uh, did a, had a small group that did uh, urban modeling we looked at how cities were going to change over time it's called lead group you can see the name over there on the, the wall of uh, champions and um, uh, recently i came back to ncsa and i've been helping with the industrial program and uh, kind of helping to find that and helping uh, our partners achieve their objectives uh, we really provide through the industrial program two separate elements. We provide sort of the computational resources, if that's all you need. If you need access to a supercomputer or a cloud environment, or you need a dedicated machine run for you, we can help partners with that aspect. Also, if you need help with um, uh, these technologies that Elena was describing, we have a whole suite of uh, researchers that are available to work on those kind of projects, and I'll give you an overview of some of the things that we've done there as well. So starting with the, uh, the computational side, and this is going to be a little bit of a virtual tour of what's in NPCF these days. Um, VForge is actually, the V stands for virtual, so that's a high performance cluster that's built on our cloud environment. Makes it a little bit different 
take a picture of it, but uh, that's kind of where we're at. Uh, it's a very small uh, system right now, but it's designed to be scalable because it's based on cloud technology. And this is available for anybody. You know, you can sign up for time. Everybody in this room can sign up for time on this uh, system. It's, uh, you know, it is $4.24 an hour. GPU nodes, a little bit more, right? Uh, Radiant is this cloud environment that we have set up. It's based on OpenStack, if uh, you've heard of that. Um, similar to what you get with AWS, obviously the big cloud providers have, have scaled up, you know, so they're providing a lot of application support in terms of databases and, and running container-based systems like Kubernetes and such. Radiant's a little more of a closer to the original offering from AWS and Azure. Uh, it's still a very useful resource that's available. We have uh, a very large um, uh, system you know, with a lot of compute nodes and uh, access to a large uh, storage system, a high performance storage system. Those are the rates. It, uh, we run it a little bit differently than you would get with AWS where you might have you have sort of on-demand nodes, and you have long-term reservation nodes. We do a compromise of that and do reservations of one month time. And that can be ongoing, obviously, but... Um, so the rates that you're seeing up there are the rates for one month of access to the Radiant. Um, and you can just build whatever you want there, you know, if you need a GPU or uh, however many processors you need on a VM, however much storage you need. Um, but in addition to those two systems, we have cutting edge systems. And one example is Holi. This is a uh, system that's based on Cerebrus and the CS2. How many people have heard of Cerebrus? It's um, what they call a wafer scale engine. Uh, so what they've done is use the entire uh, uh, the, like on the, the term now, the wafer, the entire wafer of silicone, and they don't cut it up into chips. They use it uh, completely, and so you get a, um, a, a very powerful system with a lot of internal bandwidth and a lot of internal cache, and it's really designed to be like a super GPU, with the idea that it could be as many as, depending on your benchmark, 500 A100s to 1,000. A100s. Um, and so that's also available uh, at NCSA. There's some of the, the benchmarks on it. Um, you know, one of the things we're really looking forward to, right now it's doing mostly uh, large language models, uh, but it's also going to be available to do image uh, classification and segmentation at the level of 5K by 5K images without having to tie those up. So bigger than you can actually get on, a, on a existing GPUs because of the additional memory and capability that are on this system. Um, the other environment that we have available that might be interested to some startups is Nightingale. Nightingale, as you can see in the cage environment there, is really designed to be a secure HIPAA environment. Um, so it is an extra high level of security uh, for people that need to uh, personal data, personal health data particularly. Um, it's available both as you, you can get interactive nodes uh, like with Radiant, but within this environment you can use a batch environment if you just want to have run applications on, uh, the, on, on nodes and you don't want to have an actual virtual machine or machines that you're taking in. And it's got a lot of storage that's available. It's, um, you can see some of the charges down there. Uh, again, you kind of do the, the dedicated nodes if you want those. Those are on a per month basis, on a reservation basis. Uh, otherwise, you can use a pay to go which is the uh, batch environment. And I did want to mention that that cage you saw is our uh, advanced computing health enclave. So very high security, 
available, you can do co-location within this environment if that was something you were interested in. Probably not something you're going to have available at your general um, co-location service. And finally, I want to touch on Taiga. Taiga is our center-wide file system. So all those systems I was talking about are interconnected by this internal system. Currently, and I, I see I left off the, the headline number there, there's about 12 petabytes of storage that's available across all these different systems. And you don't have to, you know, if I'm running on Radiant and I have a compute node and I want to use a batch environment, I don't have to move data around. It's already there. It's already accessible. And uh, provide you a nice integrated system, right, where you can take advantage of hybrid computing. So VForge is that that additional batch cluster, quick to get started on. If you want to have dedicated uh, nodes that are for specific applications, you can do that. And then you can also take advantage of Poli for this extreme scale machine learning training system. Um, you know, what we're hoping is we can provide sort of this progression where people can start out on VFORG since it's a very uh, straightforward system, easy to get access to and then scale up to, say, a dedicated virtual cluster if they need some additional computation or additional uh, customization. And finally, uh, move over to dedicated physical clusters. And we actually do run uh, several uh, clusters for the larger industrial partners. Right? These dedicated clusters are not using any kind of virtualization, but they, uh, they are basic uh, batch clusters. And so we have sort of this HPC cluster service. This is, again is something, you know, you're not going to get this from a co-location service or a cloud provider, right? Because we have a dedicated teams that do this all the time, and we're providing everything from all the administration and hardware setup and handling the warranties, all the networking, all the user support, how you can account on these machines, what do you do when somebody leaves, all that is taken care of. Um, uh, we do a lot of the uh, uh, administration and, and uh, management, making sure that the people within the company are aware of what the, what the system is. And, and we have weekly meetings, basically, with our partners to discuss what's going on, how the machine is being used, how we can make it better. Uh, so that's a, a just, I think, an amazing service. And we've had a lot of great uh, uh, reviews you know, for what we've done for the partners with that. Okay, so that's sort of the background on the, the computing resources that we have available. Uh, now I want to switch over to the uh, uh, technical teams. And you saw sort of a list of these earlier uh, that Lena brought up. Modeling and simulation, that's sort of the bread and butter of what NCSA has done. That would be finite element analysis and computational fluid dynamics. Basically your big uh, parallel Applications that are running on on the big iron light blue waters, um, but I want to touch on some of the other ones that we have available. And I'm going to start with data analytics, as everyone said, they were interested in AI, and this group focuses on a lot of that aspect. Um, it's kind of started to broaden out into other uh, groups that NCSA as well. Uh, but this is the first group really focusing purely on deep learning and developing those models. Uh, but they do everything from looking at market segmentation, uh, using clustering algorithms. This is developing a machine learning model to do a prediction on a um, looking at refinery, refining operations and how they could improve that over their current prediction set and even to the point of using this for uh, semi-structured big data, here we had access to the um, uh, socioeconomic information, like the census data that we would have in this country, except from India, and it had many, many challenges because they were aggregating a lot of data that had never kind of come together before from different organizations. And we were able to use machine learning and deep learning to really integrate those data sets and create a, a homogeneous set um, for researchers to take advantage of. And those are sort of uh, 
the big analytics group is kind of doing this high level, you know, you have a data set, you think it has some value, you want to do a different kind of analysis on it. Very researchy, very um, open-ended in terms of what is going to be available there. All the way through to software development. And uh, with software development, we're actually giving full featured applications, right? Most of these are web-based applications. Some of them are desktop applications. Uh, there's been uh, lots of them. They generally include a lot of um, uh, visualization components and uh, systems for interacting over, over the web. And let me see, a lot of these have GIS expertise as well. Uh, and they've developed some uh, sort of middleware that makes it a lot easier to develop those if you've got GIS applications. And finally, I want to mention Clouder, which is a open source software product. And this is designed to support the use case where you have data coming in uh, on a regular or semi-regular basis. It needs additional processing. And that processing will trigger, uh, gets triggered automatically. It could be processing that's happening uh, in the cloud. It could be happening you know, through a Kubernetes cluster that you have available. Or it could be going out to a batch environment that you have uh, that's related to it. Again, taking advantage of that shared storage that we have between uh, the different compute elements at NCSA. And finally, I'm going to mention uh, the genomics group is uh, also one of the uh, groups that have been very in demand with our industrial partners. Uh, they do a lot of work from uh, basic workflow development because if you're familiar with the genomics uh, type applications, that the workflow part is a very significant element of, of a lot of those workflows. Uh, they've been involved in uh, analysis of COVID and the development of uh, some of that work at, um, at the university. And they've also been developing NEAT as a next generation sequence analysis tool that again is open source and available for researchers. So they have an extensive experience in, in the uh, genomic area, um, both in the software development, the research, and the application uh, development. So, Fishers? Yeah, I'll just. If you don't remember the names of the different groups Jeff mentioned, that's okay. And CSA is a very fluid, dynamic, creative environment, always reorganizing, always changing group names um, based on demand, based on the expertise we have in house, based on uh, what's coming up next in the future. So. That's one thing I want to mention. And the reason I say that is, you came here for a reason. Something's in your mind. Maybe you want to hear us talk about your company. I don't know. But if you're here because you have a question and you have a problem that you need help solving, if you didn't hear us talk about it today, that doesn't mean we don't have expertise or capability. Um, a few things. through our, We're here representing the NCSA industry program, which is the outreach arm to business. We do a lot of work with faculty on campus. We also do a lot of work with government agencies, even through the industry program. We work with health organizations like Mayo Clinic and so on. We're very active in the Illinois Mayo Alliance and so on. But we're here talking about the industry program. We can connect you with other units. We're sort of a first line. You have questions, you reach out to me, and Jeff will find out who you should talk to. Um, we call it the industry program because it's a legacy name, but also because unlike many other places on campus, we are dedicated to working with industry. And that means, I've got this written here, we could work at an industrial pace. We get the NDA, we're used to working under NDA, we're used to working on, and you can read, I'll read through this real quick and then I'll tell you what I want to tell you. We have technical teams, we have HPC resources, we also have business leadership at NCSA. We have people who are trained as project managers, program managers, and so on. You don't see that as much in other places on campus. Um, the industry 
part of NCSA's mission is more than 30 years old, so we have a lot of experience both in how we work with industry and in industrial problems. Um, we do science and technology-based contract work. That's, I think, the key here. A collaborative environment, too. If you're, if you're trying to solve a problem, and you're in a small company or a startup, and you're founded by maybe a po professor or postdoc and maybe some students, first pass, you might reach out to some colleagues on campus to help you solve the problem. If those faculty members or postdocs, it's not in their research area, they're not going to be as interested in collaborating with you. We've got experts who have a lot of experience and thrive on working on different problems at NCSA. Ask us. We can develop a contract. So it doesn't have to be like, this is my research area and I only want to work on it if I'm publishing, but we can help address the problem you're facing. Small, quick. You own, in many cases, the client still owns the IP contract basis. Um, the other thing is, Jeff shows you pricing. Research park tenants get special pricing. We're also, we would not have stayed so successful and still growing at the cutting edge at NCSA if we weren't creative in funding all of our research scientists and staff, many of them on soft money. We are very, very creative at finding funding. Um, you mentioned the STTR grants. We're hoping to work on some of those. What else were we thinking? Um, we had some creative ideas at the beginning well, of this. I mean, we also have access to all our industrial partners. Right. Right. So we have the you know large Fortune 500 type companies who need the resources or the, the capabilities that you're developing, and we can help you with getting those kind of contacts. Right. Matchmaking. We can help with matchmaking too. So don't hesitate to ask us if you need help with something. Um, we also are in regular contact with other supercomputing um, organizations across the country and the world. We talk to Barcelona pretty often um, if you need something. Oh, that was the other thing I wanted to mention. Uh, you're all, oh, we, we need help with AI or that's top of mind AI. We're not, we, we're not just a site where we have the Cerebrus CS2 installed, but we have regular meetings with Cerebrus where we're partnering together and they have clients who want to build a prototype and use the CS2 chips at their company and they're asking us to come in and help the company get started and working with it. So if you're interested, we could get you right directly to the CS2 representatives and maybe figure out a custom application specifically for your problem. A lot of that kind of thing going on. Okay, uh, next slide is basically our email addresses. I don't know if I forgot anything, but um, what questions do you have for us? Share with us what you're looking for. We look forward to meeting with you. Yes. Uh, if, if we will, so is the, the technical teams is essentially like engaging with a consulting group? Is that like a master management group and still all that type of thing? And then great, great fundraisers, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, second question, if we didn't really know where to start, just this great overview, is there sort of like an initial point of contact to kind of get an overview of the project and assess you know, what parts of your organization maybe have that be? I think that's the slide we took out. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Which is our process. Yes, um, we, we do a lot of discovery work and conversations to help figure out and help you refine your understanding of the problem and figure out who you should work with. And, you know, for instance, I'd be happy to be a first point of contact. I love hearing about problems, but there is no way in the world I could solve them. But what I can do is I, I can connect dots and pull in the right people. I talk to Jeff. Jeff can talk with you too, and we can together figure out who you should talk to. Then we sit with you as you talk to the technical experts and help um, shepherd the project through before it's even funded. And then, okay, if it's a project that our technical experts aren't interested in and you don't have funding, it might be a little harder for us to be creative but if our technical experts are interested and you don't have funding, we'll, we'll try and have, work hard to find a way to make it happen. Did that answer? That's great. Yeah. Um, we could be first, first pass through. If you know someone who works there, reach out to them. But um, in the industry program, this is what we do. 
and Jeff and I are happy to do that. You probably know Brandon McGinty, the director of the industry program. He, he can help too. Um, that's what we're here for. Any other questions? Well, we hope to hear from you. I have a card here. You wrote down our email addresses. Rebecca, Laura, Laura, Kathy, all know how to reach us. We're here sometimes. We like to come here and see new things happening, so we'd love to, if you have questions, we'd like to learn from you, too. Okay, thanks. You have a great afternoon. Thanks for having us here.